Hi everyone, before I get started today, I want to tell you that this video turned out to be way longer than I wanted it to be. So what I've done is I've provided you a list of timestamps in the comments section. So you have to go to the into the YouTube, into the comments, and I have a list of timestamps because if you maybe don't really care about how I flipped and you just want to jump straight to the YouTube stuff, I have timestamps there that you can jump ahead and find out what you need. So take advantage of that if you need it. Hi, my name is Amy Reed, and in this presentation today, we're going to be talking mostly about YouTube and Edpuzzle. However, before we get to that, I want to talk to you a little bit just about me and so that you kind of know my background and my experience. Um, I am a math and physics teacher. The school where I teach at is a suburban high school, and it's in suburban Kansas City. It's in Overland Park, Kansas, um, Shawnee Mission South High School, and I teach math and physics. Um, I've been teaching those classes for several years, and I've been flipping for two years. The Algebra 2 class which I teach, I have flipped completely. Um, I, every night we have a video, and then every day we have a class, uh, an assignment that goes over that video. Um, so that class is completely flipped. My physics class is sort of partially flipped. I, f I do videos when I need to. Um, uh, physics obviously is a different content area than math is, and so you know, we don't have notes every night, we just have notes from time to time. And sometimes those videos will be my own videos, and sometimes those videos will be videos I found off the internet. So I just kind of do um, a combination in the physics class. In this class, in this presentation, most of what I'm going to be talking about is going to relate back to the Algebra 2 because that's where I've done the complete flip. And so um, that's typically what I'll be talking about throughout this. But just know that there are other ways to flip. It doesn't have to be a complete flip. In addition, next year I'm going to be teaching a class that is equivalent to an Algebra 1 class. It's called Integrated Algebra 1, and that is mostly freshmen, um, whereas the other classes I've been talking about, the Algebra 2 is freshmen and sophomores, and then the physics class is mostly juniors and seniors. So anyway, the new class that I'm going to be picking up is an Integrated Algebra 1 class. I do plan on doing some level of flip in that class, um, probably in that class would be more of an in-class flip. So those are just some varieties, some different ways that you can get your um, get into flipping at different levels. So before I go much further, I want to tell you about the video that you're watching now. Um, I am using QuickTime to film this right now. QuickTime is a program that was already on my MacBook. Um, I should back up. In my district, we all have MacBooks. Teachers have MacBooks. Um, students have school-issued MacBooks. Most of the students in our my classes, at least most of the students in my classes, have some sort of internet capability. And so that is another reason why I'm able to do the flip, is that most of my students have internet, reliable internet that they, that they can use on a daily basis. That is definitely something you want to consider before you do the flip or at what level you're going to do your flip. What I was talking about a minute ago is I do my videos using QuickTime. QuickTime is pre-installed on my laptop, so it was not something I had to purchase. Um, it was It's very straightforward to use, very easy to use, and since it was already there, I just did it. I did not, when I started flipping, I did not do much background. Um, I had done, I had done some background. I had gone to some conferences, um, listened to some presentations, done a little bit of reading, so I did have some background on that, but the technical side of it, I did not have much background on the technical side. So. I just tried to pick what was easiest and what was available to me, and QuickTime was available to me. There are many other software programs you can use, but that's what I use, and that's what I'm using now. In addition, some teachers just straight out film their video and then post it and they're good to go. I am a little bit more picky than that, and I like to have mine a little bit cleaner. So when I make mistakes, I cut those out with editing software, when I say, um, I cut that out with editing software and I do that quite a bit. So I actually do quite a bit of editing, whereas a lot of teachers who do flipping don't do any editing at all. The way I do that is I'd use iMovie. iMovie is a program which, again, is already pre-installed for me. I didn't have to do anything. Um, I was mentioning the technology we have in our district. Teachers actually have both iPads and the MacBook, MacBooks. So what I end up doing is I film it on the MacBook. I airplay it to my iPad, and on my iPad I use iMovie to edit it. Why do I do that? Because that's just um, the easiest way for me to do it. My son, at the time that I started this, he had an iPad, and so he knew how to do I, uh, iMovie, and so he was able to teach me how to do it. 
Um, so that's just how I do it. Technologically, that's how I do it. Film it on the MacBook, airplay it to the iPad. Once I get it to the iPad, I do editing through iMovie. I upload it to YouTube and that's where I store mine. And once it's stored on YouTube, I can either just share it directly from YouTube or I can share it through another platform, which we'll talk about later called Edpuzzle. So that's a little bit about me and a little bit about my technology background. I don't have much technology background um, and that's kind of just how I do things so far. At this point, what I wanna do is I wanna switch over. I've been filming using the movie um, option. You know, you can film by movie like this where you see whatever you see. You see my background back here, um, you see my face. You can show, you know, you can move your screen around and show whatever you need to show. So that's what I'm doing right now. There is another option that's called the screencast option, and that's actually the option I use most frequently. And in just a minute, I'm going to transition over and I'm going to show you what I do on the screencast. Okay, so in the next part of this video, I'm going to go through several slides that I've created just to kind of walk you through some of my experience, and then we will get into the Edpuzzle and the YouTube from there. Um, I mentioned a minute ago that I was filming using QuickTime and I was um, filming using the movie film. Um, at this point, I'm recording a screencast. And so it's the same software. I just had one video for that last portion and I've edited to put these together with it. Um, so one thing I wanna tell you a little bit about myself again, feel free please to contact me if you, if you have nobody else, or even if you, you maybe you do have other people but what i'm trying to say is when you start with flipping or with videos or whatever you will probably have lots of questions and try to find someone in your school or in your um, district that you can work with but if you can't or even if you can you just need to know someone else to to bump ideas off of please feel free to contact me um, i'm on twitter and my school email and my home email addresses are both listed here okay just a little bit of background into flipping. Um, why did I decide to flip? Well, for one, lecture was taking up too much time. In my district, Mondays, Tuesdays, and Fridays are 50-minute periods, and then Wednesday, Thursday is an odd-even block days. Um, so on Mondays, Tuesdays, and Fridays, 50 minutes is not a lot of time to be with your students if you really want to go deep in anything. And so what I was finding is that the lecture was taking up most of my time of my classroom and I didn't really like that. Um, in addition, the lecture was boring. When you are lecturing, really how many kids are actually paying attention? And I believe there's some research on that and it's much fewer than you think are paying attention. Um, and it was boring me as well. And you all know this, if you've got three or four sections of the same class, you are teaching the same thing over and over and it's terribly boring for you and the kids, they don't find it very exciting either. And finally, I also wanted students to go deeper. Like I said a minute ago, in the lecture I feel like was just like how to do it, how to do it, how to do it, how to do it, and we never went deeper into why. Why should we do this way? Why should we do that way? Why do we even study math? Things like that. And I felt like by flipping, I got more, I was able to get deeper. And we were able to work with each other more. Um, it's, to me, it has really turned out very well as far as my own teaching style it fits really well let's continue on with this thought a couple of bonuses um, precision of instruction there are fewer distractions when I was lecturing in class I would get distracted by the kid in the back of the room who's trying to talk to his neighbor I would get distracted by the kid in the other side of the room who's pulling out his phone whatever like there are a million distractions and may, for me those distracted me as well as distracting the students. So now, while the students are learning through the lecture, it is on a video. And so we don't have all of that classroom management that needs to happen, trying to keep people quiet while you're talking. Like, I'm the one talking, you all should be listening, but that isn't really how it works out. So this, to me, helped me with that. Um, I mentioned editing a little bit ago. I do editing, you don't have to, but to me, the editing helped me be more precise that I was making fewer mistakes. I mean, if I made a mistake, I could edit it out. Um, as well as the timing. I mentioned a minute ago, all the ums and things like that. The more you can, ed well, for me, I felt like the more I could edit out of all of that, then the, the more the students could focus on what they're actually supposed to learn. 
And then I had a more positive attitude throughout the class day because I was not having to deal with the person in the back of the room pulling out their phone and the person on the other side of the room talking to the neighbor and so forth. I had a more positive attitude, which has just helped me so much. I actually enjoy teaching so much more than I did a few years ago because I'm flipping. Another thing is a consistent lesson for each class period. I mentioned this a minute ago. If you have two, three, four, five sections of the same prep, you know that it changes throughout the day. And what would happen for me is I would kind of stumble through first period because I hadn't taught it in a year and I couldn't remember some of the things or, you know, what have you. I'm just stumbling, trying to get through it. Second period, I had it right. I had it down. I knew exactly what I was doing and so forth. After that, I, like I said a second ago, I started getting so bored with myself that I would start to shorten it as the day went on. And my energy level, just my physical energy level, by the end of the day, I was exhausted. And so that last class period of the day, I'm like, zoom, 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 we're done. You guys now have 30 minutes to work on your homework because I can't stand up here any longer. So this flipping has increased my energy level. I'm not exhausted. It's not as physically exhausting as it is to stand up at the board all day long. Now, and going with that, you guys know this, maybe, maybe I'm the only one. Um, you get about halfway through the day and you go, wait, have I already said this in this period? And so by flipping, by having a video, all of the students are getting the exact same information. And if you forgot to teach it in, the, in sixth period before, well, guess what? The video doesn't forget. It is, it is consistent throughout. And so that was another bonus. Everything was consistent. I mentioned energy. I had more energy in class. So I would mentioned, you know, I'm not so exhausted. Well, what the benefit of that is, I'm then able to use that and pass it on to be have better personal interactions with the students. I now have the energy that I can joke around with kids. I can ask them how was their weekend. I can, you know, all that stuff where before I felt like I was so rush, 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 rush. How can I possibly ask someone about their weekend when we've got to cover the quadratic formula today? So this really allowed me to have more energy in class, which allowed me to relax and be with my students and be more relational. And really overall, I can't tell you, I really feel like I'm a much better teacher because I'm flipping. Um, just real quickly, this is how I used to do the flip. When I started flipping my classroom, I took it very literally. And so I thought that if a lecture used to take about 20 minutes, then the students should watch a 20 minute video at home. After that, I realize that now I realize it's not as literal. Um, and I'll get into that a little bit more when we talk about the different platforms. But students would watch a video at home, fill in their guided notes, we'd come to class, we'd do a little bit of Q&A at the beginning of class, um, followed up by some practice problems, and then which we would go over a problem or two as a group. Most of the class period, though, is spent on the actual assignment, the follow-up assignment, which might be a more traditional worksheet or a book assignment, or a more, it might be a more partner-based activity. And again, we're gonna get into a little bit of that later as well. But then we would just repeat that. So it was video at home, assignment during class, a video at home assignment during class. Now, when we got to March, and in my school, um, our spring break started on March 13th, and of course we never came back to school after that. And so in my class, things changed, obviously, for fourth quarter. And so a couple things that changed, and a couple things that worked. First of all, I felt like because I had been flipping, both me and my students were a little bit more prepared than some of the other teachers and some of the other students because students were already used to watching the videos and taking notes. Um, I was already used to making videos and posting them. So the systems were already set up. The students already had accounts for Edpuzzle. The students already knew where to ac access my YouTube playlist. We had this class rhythm and routines which the students were used to and I was able to pretty well keep to those routines throughout my fourth quarter. Um, now, of course, not all, because we all know it was, it was a hot mess during that fourth quarter all around. But I felt like because we had done some flipping before, me and my students, both, all of us were more prepared for what was happening at that point. One of the major changes that I made is I cut my videos and my lessons down drastically. I basically cut them in half, and I knew I had to do that. Um, research says you can't watch, the students can't watch a 20-minute video and really learn as well as they need to. And I knew that, 
but I didn't know how to fix it. Um, but COVID made me fix it. So I cut my, my videos in half. Um, whereas before my videos were really the shortest video I might have had, might have been 15 minutes, but really it was typically more like a 20 or 25 minute video, sometimes even up to 30 minutes long. And again, I knew that wasn't right, but I couldn't fix it. I didn't know what to do. This made me fix it. So I cut them in half. My videos now during COVID were more like 10 to 15 minutes. And I even felt bad if they were 15 minutes long, but they were 10 to 15 minutes. Um, and then I also had to cut my assignments down. When we got to our classroom Zoom meetings, which again, each district was different, but in my district, what we did, or well, it was a lot of up to teachers what to do. Um, there were no grades taken during this time. Zoom meetings were not mandatory, but I had a Zoom meeting with my Algebra 2s. I had a Zoom meeting twice a week. And so um, once on Monday and once on Thursday. And what I did was I basically tried to mimic my class time because we had already been in this routine of you watch a video on your own and then we come to class and talk about it. And so that's what I tried to do at my Zoom meetings. I had an agenda, which I normally, uh, during the school year, I have an agenda posted on my whiteboard. So this is kind of carrying that through. So that same agenda that I would normally have on my whiteboard at school, I posted that agenda so kids knew what we were going to have in the Zoom meeting. And it, uh, I think a little bit helped them to see, why should I go to the Zoom meeting? Like, what is even going to go on? Why should I show up? Well, if I have an agenda, there might be something on there that you actually need and would help you. Um, I did a little Padlet question that was new. That was not something I normally did during class time, but when we got to COVID time, I had a little Padlet question today. We worked on a little warm up problem, just like we would normally do. I tried to break them up into groups like I would normally do. And we would have questions and answers like, are there any questions over the homework from the last couple of nights? That kind of thing. So I tried to mimic the class time as well as possible. I really was happy with how my class Zoom times went for my Algebra 2s. So that was a class I had flipped. Um, because we all had a similar experience, we all were familiar with how this worked, how we're supposed to watch a video, and then how we're supposed to ask questions about it, and how we're supposed to talk to our partners, things like that. Those were already established, so it went relatively well. Next school year, I do plan to start the year with a flipped model in as many classes as possible, as much as possible. So I mentioned, you know, my physics is not a total flip, but I'm going to try to do more of it just so that we will have that in place. Those systems will be in place. Um, kids will already have familiarity with the softwares or the platforms, and I will have more familiarity with the platforms. Um, because I do think, I mean, I hope we don't have to go back to remote learning, but I just think that it's very likely, you know, all the universities are closing down in November. I think the public schools might do the same. Okay, so you have decided to flip your class or at least do the videos, right? So you need to think about a couple of things. First of all, realize that students have watched videos for entertainment. If you have kids of your own, or even if you don't, you know they are on Netflix all the time. They're on YouTube all the time. However, they do not watch very many videos for educational purposes. Sometimes they do. Like if they want to get better at Minecraft, they'll find a Minecraft video that helps them get better at Minecraft. But again, that's just not very academic, right? So we are going to have to teach them how to watch a video for your class. You really have to practice in class first. And again, this is something that I had learned um, through some of the research that I've done, but I was not, I know I didn't always do the best job of it. But at the very beginning of the school year, you are going to need to help them learn and you're going to have to practice it in class. So if possible, if we are in class, which I think most of us will be in August, hopefully. Um, one thing is at a very basic level, help them get logged in. Getting logged into a new software platform is not easy. So you'll want to do that. You will also want to help them see how you're going to be expecting their notes. Um, help them to stay engaged. I mentioned a while ago, if you've got a 20 minute video, it is really hard to stay engaged for that full 20 minutes. However, if you're making 10 minute videos, 15 minute videos, which is more in line with what you should be doing, um, the kids will will understand that, but they will still need some help staying engaged. And show them things like, hey, when you need to rewind it, this is you know a place that you could rewind it and rewatch, maybe you don't understand that, let's rewind it, rewatch it again. 
Another thing is, I have never done this, but I have seen out there, and I don't remember where I saw it, um, some teachers use a, diff a, a non-academic skill first. For instance, let's say origami. They're going to make cranes with origami, right? So you have them watch a video on how to make these origami cranes. And you then have them take notes on that, and they then have to explain that to someone else. Well, something like that is going to help them see they're rewinding it over and over. They're rewatching it. They're practicing it. Probably their hands are busy. They're folding the paper while the other person's folding the paper. So all of that is helping them realize how to stay engaged with the video and not just watch it passively. Um, a couple other things to do is you want to provide your students the framework for taking notes. I myself use the Cornell note method um, and I print out guided notes at the beginning of each unit and each video has these notes and my screencasts are basically of my notes and I'm filling them in with pencil as I go. Um, and I guess another technology note, what I do for that is I use a Wacom tablet um, and I, I'm able to, and I use smart board software. So I'm able to write on the Wacom tablet on top of the smart board software and that's how I do some recordings. And I can show you a little bit of that later if you want to see that as well. Um, so I, that's what I do. I print out guided notes. And then the students fill in these guided notes while they're watching the videos. I'm also filling it in on the video. So they're just mimicking exactly what I'm doing as they're watching it. Choose, I really think it's going to be important for you to choose something consistent so it's easier for the students to follow along. So like I said, I use these Cornell notes. I use the same format. I have this template that I use. They're familiar with it. They know what it is. So again, if and when things fall apart, like a pandemic hits, they have that structure. For you, maybe it's not Cornell Notes. Maybe it's some kind of a KWL chart or maybe it's any other kind of graphic organizer that you want to use. But be consistent with some kind of framework. Students are not going to be able to just watch a video and retain. You're going to have to guide them and show them how to take notes. Also, Decide what you are going to do with the students who have not watched the video. Are you going synchronous or asynchronous? Um, so as I, when I started this, I was synchronous. And um, there's another teacher in my building who did it. And I asked her, what do you do with students who don't, don't watch the video? And she says she literally has this section of the room. As anyone who hasn't watched the video, you need to go over to this section and watch the video. So I started that and I did that. And I have to tell you, I did it for a year, and it just did not sit well with me. It just was not my style. Um, I just, it didn't work for me. So I had to reevaluate, and I had to start thinking about how important are these videos. Um, I was teaching Honors Algebra 2. Do these kids already know this, and they don't need to watch a video? Or, you know, what's going on? Consider the student's home life. Maybe at school, this kid looks like they are on top of the world, but then at home, you don't know what their home life is. I've done surveys along the way, you know, first quarter survey, second quarter survey, that kind of thing. And one thing that I have had is people say, it's hard for me to watch the videos at home because my home is so crazy. So some kid, for some students, that means I've got a little brother or sister who's always bugging me. For other students, it might be something more severe. So just consider their home life. Consider what are you going to do. What I ended up doing was maybe going too far in the other direction. And I, it, even though it was not asynchronous, I was a lot more lenient on if you've watched the video or not. And basically, some students would self-select and say, can I please go out in the hall and watch the video because I haven't watched it yet. But some students... Um, so just so stayed at their table and, and watch the video at their table, what that does then is it kind of breaks up the group dynamic that you might have wanted to have the group project or whatever it is they're working on. So anyway, just you are going to have to decide how strict you're going to be on watching the videos um, and how, you know, how, how mandatory they're going to be, things like that. Those are all things that you want to consider before you get in too deep into it. And so related to that, what kind of accountability will they be for watching the videos? Do they submit their notes to you? Will you grade the questions on Edpuzzle? So I'll again tell you my experience. I was having them write paper notes with a pencil on paper. And then at the end of the unit, I collected binders. And I know that I was very old fashioned in that, but I just felt like that was the best way for me to do this. So I would collect their binders and I would go through their papers. 
I will tell you, <laughs> with COVID, I am not interested in collecting binders. I will not be doing binders anymore. Um, but I need to decide, okay, if you're not going to do binders, how are you going to do this? What's the accountability going to be? So Edpuzzle allows you to embed some questions into the videos. And so maybe you're going to require that they do an Edpuzzle and you're going to grade those questions. I don't know. But you just need to think about what kind of accountability is there going to be, if any, for watching the videos. Um, and then once they've watched the video, now what? And so again, decide what you want to do to follow up with that. Do you want to follow up? Some teachers have like almost like um, an, a, an entry quiz. You know what I mean? Like at the beginning of the hour, they'll say, okay, we're going to have three questions here about the video. And they do a quick three question quiz over the video each day. Maybe you want to have some kind of discussion. Maybe you have a Q&A over the video. I will emphasize that all the research says do not reteach. If you are going to reteach, what you're ending up doing is saying that video wasn't important and kids won't watch the video. If you are reteaching every day, those kids are not going to watch the video. What I end up doing is I, I, I kind of varied it from day to day, but typically it would be something like I have them sitting in groups of four, which again, I'm going to have to reevaluate because we all know we're not going to have group seating probably in the fall. But I would have them in groups of four and I'd say, okay, discuss with your partners these three questions. And I would have three questions on the board for them to discuss. Or I would say, okay, work with your partners and write out a summary or, you know, whatever. Like there would just be kind of a, a very informal discussion typically. And then I would have a couple of warm-up problems that were not directly from the notes, but they were typical problems that would have been covered in the notes, maybe a slight extension so that they would be able to then now do the assignment. But again, you're going to have to decide how are you going to follow up the video. Now, the main advantage to flipping a classroom, in my opinion, is the options with the assignments. That does not have to be the traditional worksheet. It can be. And honestly, a lot of days when I'm not feeling very creative, that's what I'm going to do. It's just going to do a traditional worksheet or a book assignment. The advantage, though, is they don't have to be sitting by themselves at home doing it. They are now sitting with a group of four, and with that group, hopefully they can put their heads together and figure out how to do this assignment. Um, but maybe it's not just a traditional. Maybe you want to go a little bit more creative. You can make the assignment into a game. Um, I used to play a game called Matho, which is kind of like bingo. Uh, you could use Quizlet Live. You could use a Kahoot. Um, I would have to go back to Kahoot. I feel like the Kahoots that I've been have been more like quizzes rather than... Um, kind of assignments like this, but you know, you've got a variety of things that you can do to make the assignment into a game. Maybe you want to jigsaw the worksheet. So you say, okay, in your table, who's person A, person B, person C, so forth, and divide up the assignment. You do one, two, three, you do four, five, six, etc., and then do a jigsaw. Um, or similar to that, a speed dating. One person takes each one, each person takes one problem, you set them in two circles, and you do a speed dating. Um, you can do a flip grid where, you know, one person in your group has to do each problem, but then you have to make a flip grid on it. And on that flip grid, you're going to explain how to do that problem. Another thing is student choice. I feel like this, um, the, with the pandemic, one thing I learned is how to incorporate more student choice. That maybe they don't have to do the exact um, worksheet. Maybe they have, I don't know. I've got I just feel like student choice is going to become more and more important as we go asynchronous. Um, so that's another thing to consider is that your assignment doesn't have to be the same for everybody. If it is going to be synchronous and you're going to have basically a due date, so the, the video has to be watched tonight and the assignment has to be done in class, then you need to decide how you're going to address it when students don't finish the assignment. What you will find when you start out, what I found when I started out, was that my assignments were too long. They were not fitting into that class period. And so then that first year, I thought, well, they didn't finish it because they were talking too much. And so we just need to make sure we finish that at home. But then what happens is they get home, they have a worksheet to finish, and they have a video to watch, and then they feel overwhelmed. So that I ended up switching um, and being a lot more lenient of realizing that the group time takes a lot more time to work through than it does to work through something on your own because you're discussing, you're debating, and all of that is valuable, good things. So usually what I do now is if the students don't finish the assignment, I say, don't worry about finishing it. We will finish it on Friday. Or, you know, just, just putting it off or maybe even cutting it off 
but you need to decide how you want to address what happens. If you're staying synchronous, what's going to happen if students don't finish it during that class period? Okay, so I just went over quite a bit of information with you just about my background um, with my experience flipping, but I do want to get to the point of the presentation, which was titled um, YouTube or Edpuzzle. Which one should you use? And really, it's a matter of preference, but I want to take a little bit of time to go through with you and show you what are some of the advantages or disadvantages of each platform. So with YouTube, mainly, well, there are many advantages to YouTube. It's a great platform, um, but it has unlimited and free storage. And we will look at a couple things on my um, YouTube in just a minute so you can see. Again, before I did this, I did not have a YouTube channel. Well, actually, I did because um, we're a Google school, and so... Um, all the, you know, we, we automatically have a channel. If you, if your school uses Google, you probably have a channel also. You just don't know about it. But I didn't know about it, and it's, but it's very easy to use and set up. And anyway, it is unlimited free storage. The students can watch the videos at up to two times the speed or slow it down to 0.25 speed. That maybe is my favorite part about using YouTube and also the students' favorite part about using YouTube. When I first started watching video or making videos, I was trying to build in things like um, wait time. So in class, when I'm teaching, I might have a little bit of wait time and let them process. And I was trying to build that into my videos. What that was doing is making my videos really, really long. And when students watch videos, they're not watching it with the same mindset as they are if, you're, if they're watching it in live. Like when they watch my video, they don't want that wait time. Um, and maybe I want to build that in and I can talk about that. But Anyway, this allows them to speed it up or slow it down because I tend to talk really slowly on my student videos. I'm learning. I need to go faster because kids want to get through it. And one good example of this is if you have ever watched a video. Have you ever watched a video for educational purposes? And if so, you maybe have sat through some professional developments online or on Zoom or what have you recorded, which you're thinking, would these people just hurry up and go faster? And so... When I do that, I go to YouTube and I hit it on 1.5 or 2.0 speed and I speed it up. You can also slow it down. Some of the videos in my physics class, I like to assign the crash course videos. She does a really good job of summarizing units in crash course. She is really fast. She talks super fast and I warn the students she's going to talk really fast. In that case, students want to, might want to slow it down and that's an option for them. That's in YouTube. The students like it because they have more freedom because of the speeding up, slowing down thing. And just that it's an, such an easy online platform to use. The students really like using YouTube. And as a teacher, I can be organized and make playlists. So let me go over to YouTube now and show you some of the things that I'm talking about. So when I log into YouTube, this is my channel. Um, these are... These are just some recent videos that I've uploaded recently, but if I go to videos, then it will show me all of the videos that I've uploaded. And as I said, it is unlimited, so I have a bunch of videos in here. That's on YouTube. I can also go to playlists, and I have created playlists for each unit that I teach. The problem with this in YouTube, it is not very organized. So here I have Algebra 2, I have Algebra 2 Unit 9, Algebra 2 Unit 6, and then I have Physics. This is really just um, right now organized by date of the last time that I uploaded something. So last time I uploaded something, it was this function creation project that was like our final project. You can go to Sort By, and you can click on Date Created, Newest, Oldest, or Last Video Added. That's not very helpful to me. I want them alphabetized. Since it is not very well organized, what I did is I just created a Google Doc and I created a Google Doc for my students so they can see here's where you go. So now if a kid wants to learn about systems and matrices they can just come to the Google Doc and then they get into my YouTube channel where the playlist for systems and matrices is. And so this is all the um, videos that I have on systems and matrices and they can find the one that they want a little bit easier than scrolling through my entire channel. Okay, so that is on YouTube. Let me go back to my channel here for just a second. So here we are back on my channel. Okay, I will show you a couple of quick examples here. Here is my Matrix Basics video. So if I click on this video, and it's going to load up, and 
just to clarify, if you have a matrix, that is one, but the plural is called matrices. So just so okay. you know what I'm so talking about. So here's my about. video that I've made. I'm going to show you just real quickly. I'm using smart software, so that's what this is in. Um, I'm writing on it on my Wacom tablet with a pen, pen. I can, you know, whatever you need to do with um, the smart software. I have uploaded a PDF of my notes. So these are my notes. I'm able to write on the notes and fill in blanks or what have you. So that's what's going on here. Now the students, if they think I'm talking too slowly, they can come down here to settings and they can change the playback speed. And they say, you are talking way too slow. I'm going to go to 1.5. And now when they listen to it, it's going to be much faster. When I say for matrices, them. that means there's two of them. Matrix is one. A matrix is really just a way of organizing your information. And so if you have a table. Okay, so that is an option. And again, you can slow it down also. So here I am at a playback speed. I can slow it down to 2.5. And I mentioned the woman from um, Crash Course, and she talks really fast, so they might want to slow it down. Also within YouTube, you can click on the closed captions. Now, these are, as it set up there a second ago, they are auto-generated. They are not something that I had to make. YouTube software is able to listen and create closed captioning for me, and I didn't have to do that. So the students can do that as well. That helps sometimes if... Um, I don't do this a lot, but maybe like in a social studies or an English class, like you have a longer fill in the blank. Well, if you're talking it here, then they can pause and they can see what you're doing. Okay, so closed captioning is auto-generated. You just have to be careful. There are some times that um, it, their voice software doesn't get it right. And so I actually have never really previewed mine, um, but that is an option that you might want to consider to see if, if YouTube is even picking it up. Okay, so that is slowing and, and um, speeding up and slowing down. Okay, so that's YouTube. What about Edpuzzle? Well, Edpuzzle to compare. Remember, YouTube is unlimited free storage. Edpuzzle has 20 free videos, and then it goes up to $9.50 a month. Or your school district can get a plan for the whole district, and I don't even know what that is, but we don't have that. Um, teachers can allow skipping or not, but not changing speeds. So back in YouTube, I, again, didn't know this, but I have a teenage son, so now I know it, that in YouTube, you can click to fast forward. I'm going to show you that real quick. It's very similar. Okay, so I'm just going to go back to um, the same video. I'm going to play it back at normal speed, and you can click on your keyboard to fast forward a couple seconds. So I'm going to show you what that is. If I had this table, I could organize this information into a matrix. Okay, if I hit the arrow, just by, so it I can jumps just ahead. Now, and it's the jumping ahead, I think, five or six seconds each time. Just by, what a matrix so students know that, and they know how to click ahead. Entry. On their phones, they click on the actual screen, but on your computer, you click on the right arrow button. And you can do the same going backwards. So the matrix is made up each. I can skip backwards real quick if I need to just watch a little part. So, that's so students really like it because they have more control over the video. In Edpuzzle, they don't have as much control, and the idea being... We as teachers, we want to control our environment a little bit more, right? And so what we can do because of this control, Edpuzzle allows us to embed questions, um, even make it into a quiz. And so I'll show you that here in just a second. It also keeps a grade book for you. It keeps a record of who has watched it as well as what parts were watched. So let me go real quickly to Edpuzzle and show you some things there. Okay, so when you first just go to Edpuzzle, um, you do have to create an account, which is free, and my account over here, um, if I go to here, I've got 19 out of 20 storage used. In other words, I've uploaded 19 videos out of my total 20 allowed, and so that's that. Um, get more space, that is where you would pay. And so they have, you know, here's what you get if, if you have the basic plan, here's what you get if you have the paid per month plan, and then if your district pays, this is what you get from there. So you can go through there and find that. Also, it does integrate with these um, products. And my school is just starting to use Canvas. We were using Google Classroom. Um, I don't actually know exactly how all of this integrates. But that is, for some of you who might know, that is available. And so back in Edpuzzle, I'm going to go back to that home page of Edpuzzle. Here's my home page for Edpuzzle. Um, up here, content is what I'm looking at now. 
I could click over here and go to my content, which I'm going to do in just a second. Um, I can also look at my gradebook, my classes, and that's just my account information here. So I'm going to go to my content. And so here are the 19 videos that I have uploaded. Um, just real quickly at a glance, I can show you a couple of things. You can see on these videos, these are my normal Cornell Notes videos that I typically do. This was a graphing video, and so I was able to put my TI graphing calculator emulator on there. And then this is a face intro. I actually, when I do back to school, I did it the first time last year, but I think all of us might be doing it now, is we did a video, I did a video for my back to school night for my parents. And so I'm gonna use that here in just a second. I'm gonna show you um, a couple of things about it. So if I'm going to create a new assignment, so that's what I'm gonna do now. I'm gonna click on this face intro, and that's the one I wanna do. I can edit this video. And so I click on edit and I can cut it. I can do a voiceover. I can make questions. Okay, let's just say I don't, I'm not interested in cut. Well, if you do want to cut it, all you do is you do this. You just drag this blue line and you drag it to wherever you want it to be. And so that's what you can do. Um, <laughs> getting ready for my video there. Um, questions is what I want to talk about now. Let me back up. Voiceover, I've never actually done a voiceover but it makes sense. I mean, you can play someone else's video. Like in physics, I play demo, demo videos, like other physics teacher doing physics demos. I could voice over on that if I wanted to, okay? But let's go back to questions. When I go to questions, so here's my video, and I start talking, and maybe I wanna put in a question, okay? In questions, I'm going to put my question right here. That's why I've stopped there. The question is going to go there. I can click on multiple choice question, and these are actually, some of these are new. So this will be graded automatically. Um, Open-ended, that would be for the teacher to grade. And then a note, if you wanted to write a note on there, you could insert a note, something that you needed to point out. Sometimes, I've never done this before, but sometimes things I'd wish I had this because I can say, oops, I made a mistake. It's not actually negative four, it's positive four, something like that. But if we go to multiple choice question, then you would just type in your question. Um, you know, what is your teacher's name? And then you can type in your choice options here. And so pretty straightforward. So that's how you can do that. You can create this. So, and when it, let me back up, when it does this, it stops the video, and we'll see that here in just a second. It will stop the video where the students have to answer it before they can go on. Okay, let's say I'm going to say, Amy, Mark, say, all right. Um, now, once they get to that question, if you want to write another question, you would just doing a good job. We've been learning a lot of new information. Pause there and put in a new question there. Um, why are my eyes like that? I don't know. <laughs> so you can, and then let's just say finish. So we're going to finish this. Now, if I wanted to assign this, I have my hours set up. Um, and that's something that you do on your own. You set up your own classes and you have student, each class has a code. And so then when you provide that code to the students, the students log in and that creates your classes. In other words, I don't have to create them. Um, although I believe you can also import them from Google Classroom. You can probably do the same thing for all those other ones, for Schoology and Canvas and everything else. So you choose when you want to assign it, choose your due date. Um, now, preventing skipping. Right now, preventing skipping is on. I can turn that off. Um, if I want to allow them to skip, I can change that. If you don't want them to skip, you stick with the default. So let me just say I want to assign it to this particular class and I want to assign it to everybody, although you could do a list like in Google Classroom. You can check on, check on which students need the video. I could do the same thing okay, here. So here I'm going to assign it. And when I assign it, here's my first hour class. I have changed the names um, because of privacy. I changed the names here, so that's what's going on here. Um, but this would be my first hour roster. And when they when these students log in, they will see that there's a new video assigned to them. At this point, I can share the assignment so that my students know it's there. So yes, if they logged in, it would show up, but I could also share it. And when I hit 
share button, I can assign it through a link, which is what I typically do. I, sh I use Google Classroom, so I assign it through a link through Google Classroom, or you can have this code. And again, because I've never used a LMS before, I'm not sure how to do that, but maybe that works for you. Okay, so let's move over and start talking about the gradebook. So if I come up here, um, I've got content, I've got my classes, I want to go to gradebook. And if I go to the gradebook, these are the assignments that we see, which obviously is not very many, so let me go to a different tab where I've set something up. The reason there aren't many here is because it's just for today and I haven't assigned anything today, so that's why. So if I go here, I change the date back to May 6th. So everything back from May 6th is showing up on this screen. Um, so a couple things to look at. This screen will show you these little progress bars underneath each video. And so Mason, he dropped my class. He has zero seconds recorded. But Sophia, she has spent two hours watching videos and it shows you which videos she's watched. The ones that are in green um, means that she has watched most of it. Uh, the ones that are in red means she didn't watch a whole lot of that one. And if it's in yellow, it's kind of in the medium area. So let me go ahead and click on one of these. Let me go down here to Coco. And Coco has this one that's yellow, so I'm going to show this one to you. So I click on it. It shows me that she has watched 70% of this video. Um, it breaks up every video into segments. There are 10 segments it breaks it up to. And that way you can see what percentage. So that's where this getting, they're getting this percentage from. She has watched 7 of the 10 segments. No matter how long your video is, I believe, no matter how long their video is, they're going to break it up into 10 segments. So here we have those 10 segments. She watched 70% of it. Each of those she just watched one time. So she started here, watched it through. Let's go back to a different student. Okay, so back here, I'm going to go back to Sophia on this unit circle coordinates. I want to know what happened, why her little progress bar is red and so small. So I'm going to click on this. She watched only 20% of it. Um, she watched this first segment and then skipped and watched the second segment and then something happened and she just stopped watching. So that shows you um, some information about what she did or did not watch. But if we go back to another video that she has, so back to Sophia, here are the another video. The next video is on six trig ratios. And I want to show you this one because here's what she did. She watched it, watched it, watched it, and then she re-watched this one section. And then she watched this, and then she skipped this section, and so forth. So it will show you if people rewind it and rewatch it, it shows it to you. And also, like I said before, if they've skipped it, they watch it as well. Also, notice that she only has a 90% watched because when you skip a box, it lowers your percent to 90%. She's still in the green. And if I just glanced at this and was just looking for the green, I would think that she watched it. Um, I don't actually know the cutoff. I have a feeling that 90-80% uh, is the cutoff for the greens, although I'm not sure. I do know that one of my students had a 70% and it was yellow. And this person has a 90% and they are green, so I'm guessing it's 80% is the cutoff between green and yellow. Um, and then we can go look at one that's red as well. Okay, back in my roster, I want to take a look at Hudson because um, his paper folding video is red, so that's interesting. I want to see what's going on. He watched 40% of the video. Look what he did. Hudson's a pretty smart kid. He probably skipped through this because he already knew all this. And then he got here and he started watching where he, you know, he didn't need to know all that previous information. So he starts watching here. He re-watches this section and then watches those two. It shows up as 40%. But this is obviously a different case than somebody who had watched the first half and then stopped for the second half. So again, you just are able to look at and see more specifically. And I want to show you another screen. I changed my start date back to the beginning of the 2019 school year up until that first month and a half, basically. These are the videos I signed in that first month and a half. Notice this screen is different. I will tell you, I don't, I have not used the grading, the gradebook option very much because it did not, it did not integrate with my gradebook. Um, but I want to show you this because this is an even more interesting view, I think, that you can see specifically how much time they've spent. And yes, you have the progress bar, but then it even specifically shows you within that progress bar how much time those students spent on those videos. And then for the um, time that I've selected, it will go in ahead and averaged 
the ones, I guess those were the ones that I had actually maybe assigned technically. Um, so this person, for instance, it averaged it and said they got a 60% because they have three out of the five videos done. There are ways to grade the questions and honestly, I haven't done that a whole lot, so I'm not going to get to that in this video. Let's go ahead and get back to our notes on the Google Slides. So Edpuzzle allows the teacher a lot of control and a lot of options for the teachers, embedding multiple choice questions, open-end questions, um, keeping a record of all those things. I didn't investigate it just now, but um, it will show you their score. Like if you have 10 questions, what their score was. It, um, it you, you can go through and grade if they are those open-ended questions. You can go through and grade those questions. And so again, you can see exactly how well people know things. Um, that's helpful. When I was first doing this, they didn't have multiple choice. They only had the open-ended. And there was one student who every answer he was saying X. What that tells me is he wasn't actually reading the question. He was just playing the video in the background, hitting X when any, whenever a question came up and then kept going. So it allows you to see into what the students have done on their end. Okay, so Edpuzzle sounds really great. Why not use it? And to me, it boils down to students have less control over the experience and students can't speed up or slow down. When I first started flipping, I wanted to use Edpuzzle because I needed to know who's watching and who's not. Even the second year, I was using Edpuzzle in the first quarter, and actually the first year I did it just the first quarter as well. I do it in the first quarter so that I can help them get into a routine. Um, we all know you give them too much freedom, they probably aren't going to do what you're supposed to do, right? So this allowed me to have a little bit more control over it to see what they were doing. But like I said before, my videos were longer. They were like 20 minutes. And if my video is that long, the kids get really frustrated with Edpuzzle because they can't skip, they can't fast forward. They're thinking this is a really long 20 minute video and I don't wanna watch all this. And I had those questions built in to kind of stop them along the way. Um, another thing is I mentioned having like wait time. And so often in my video, I will do, like, I'll do one problem. I'll say, okay, here's this problem. Here's how you work it out. I'll explain the whole thing. And then I will have another problem. I'll say, okay, I'm going to pause here, and I'm going to give you some time to work on this problem. And then I'll build in one of those hard stops in Edpuzzle where there will be a hard stop. And I'll have a question like, okay, now that you've solved it, what did you get for why? And they'll have to tell me what the, you know, what the answer is. And so... It allows, again, it allows the teacher to have some insight. The students, though, don't have a lot of freedom. And with those 20-minute videos, they were not liking that at all. So I would, for the first quarter, I used Edpuzzle so I can kind of help them get into a routine. And then after that, once they had a routine set up, then I went to YouTube, which allowed them a lot more freedom. What that did for me, though, I didn't know anymore who was watching them and who didn't, who didn't. But honestly, I didn't really care at that point. My I was more concerned with, did they learn? And so if they already knew the material, I don't care if they don't watch the video. If they can learn it from a different way, I don't care if they don't watch the material. I typically, what I was saying in my classroom is I would say, you need to have the paper notes filled out. How you fill those out is up to you. I go through a video and I show you exactly what I want you to write down. If you don't want to watch that video, that's okay but you need to still do the problems and show me that you know this stuff. If you think you know it, you need to show me you know it. So that's the way I did it. That, that allowed the students have a little bit more control. Kids don't like to be controlled entirely. And that's also not my personality style. I, allow, I like to allow them more, um, more space to do things on their own. And you know, if they don't need to watch a video, like I said, if they don't need to, they don't have to. The skipping thing on Edpuzzle is... Um, helpful and I kind of think that's new. That is more helpful because it allows them to skip. However, if I was taking a grade on that, I would probably say you still have to be in the green and I don't know what the green is, if it's 80% or 75% or whatever. But those are just some things that you can think about um, as you're deciding how to post your videos. Both of them are good platforms for teachers to use and they, in their own way, each have a lot of advantages. A couple more things. Um, Edpuzzle will stop if students try to do anything else on their device while watching. So I mentioned a minute ago that that kid was just having it going in the background. I didn't mean the background of his computer. I meant like the background of his desk. <laughs> so he was just playing it on his desk somewhere 
and he was over here doing something else, playing a video game, I don't know, um, on a different device. So anytime they try to open a different tab or watch Netflix or anything like that, it actually won't let them. It will stop playing if they go to something else. So that's an advantage. And then also, like I've been saying, even when they do skipping, it shows you how much they skipped. What I'm thinking about for being asynchronous next year is I'm thinking about saying, okay, have you watched, you know, 80% of 80% of the videos? And so I can look and see how much they've, they've watched before I give them an assessment of some kind. And so, like I said, in the end, it's really personal preference. If you want to allow students the freedom with YouTube, or if you want to have a little bit more control with Edpuzzle, um, how much of it you want to have feedback on. If you are just assigning a video and you don't really need feedback directly from the video, then YouTube is just fine. If you want some feedback, then Edpuzzle is a much better platform for that. Finally, I just want to tell you guys, I think you can do this. Um, if you have been thinking about it, or if you're looking for a change, or you would just know that you have to have a change because situations have changed, go for it. You totally can do this. You don't have to have it all figured out. You can figure it along the way as you go. That's what we do. We're teachers. We do that all the time, right? Um, adjust as we need to. When I started, I had never made a video before. Um, my first videos were awful. They had terrible audio quality. I did a survey. And the students told me that. And I knew it already, but it, when you get the information from the students, you know. And so I made a change. And I changed my videos. Um, I changed my setup. And I learned a little bit more. I knew I had to do a little bit more. Um, so you can do this. Um, find a teacher, somebody. If it's someone in your building or in your district, that'd be great. If it's not, find someone online that you can bounce ideas off of, that you can go to for advice. If you want to email me, contact me on Twitter, whatever, um, to get advice, I am happy to answer your questions. You might have a wonderful um, instructional coach. I had a wonderful instructional coach who really encouraged me. Um, she let me borrow her book, Flipping with Kirsch, and that helped me as I read through there, get some ideas. Um, you're not going to follow, I mean, as you know, you're probably not going to follow anyone else's ideas exactly. You try to pick up ideas and you modify. And again, that's what we do. I had another, like I mentioned, that chemistry teacher, and I would go to her for ideas. I would take her ideas, and then I would make them work for me. I would be happy to help you out anytime. I totally think you can do this. It is not as hard as you think it is. I feel like if I can do it, anyone can do it. It is not that bad. So make the best of it. Um, we are all going to have to deal with situations we have, which are not great situations coming up, but we're going to make the best of it, and we're going to do the best we can. So I really hope that you've enjoyed this presentation. I hope it helps. And again, I'll put that information about myself up on the screen again so that you can use that information to contact me. Um, I would love to help you out if you need it.